Introduction Once upon a time, a hundred years ago, U.S. Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signed the proclamation at 8 o'clock a.m. on August 26, 1920, that certified ratification of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote after an almost century-long suffrage struggle by thousands of women and men. This is the story of an American woman from the Midwest and several colleagues who joined the struggle in the last decade that led to passage of the amendment. This novel shows their involvement and challenges within the local, statewide, and national suffrage movement. This is a work of fiction, but I tried to adhere to historical facts as much as possible, and any literary license taken with some events is only my interpretation. Many women and some men endured violence and harassment in the suffrage movement. The story includes a little of that based on published, first-hand accounts by suffragists of actual events. Some scenes were difficult to write, not for lack of information, but for having to experience reliving some of the brutality they endured. Referring to the movement as a struggle is an enormous understatement. The sacrifices of the suffragists should never be forgotten. The main character and her friends and acquaintances are purely fictional, as is her town. She does meet several suffragists from history in her journey. As I strive to portray an accurate historical story, any errors not caught by my editors are my own. Eric T. Reynolds, August 2020 It is better, as far as getting the vote is concerned, I believe, to have a small, united group than an immense debating society. Alice Paul, American Suffragist Prologue Spring 1894 The Flint Hills Outside Sycamore Falls, Kansas Catherine Wolfe vaulted over the boulder. An outcrop loomed above. This was the fastest she'd ever made it this far. Trailing and climbing on rocks is no place for a lady. She had heard too many times. She loved the exertion of trailing up hills, and if boulders got in the way, all the better. But as she reached up for a handhold on the craggy ledge and was about to call up to her friend Mary, she gave in to the temptation to glance out at the sea of green hills rippling to the horizon. She shouldn't have. At least the grassy area a little ways down was free of rocks. This was Catherine's second attempt to scale that rocky protrusion. And on its second attempt, suffrage failed to pass in Kansas that year. Chapter 1 September 1911 Sycamore Falls High School During the fourth week of school, lockers and the lingering scent of freshly painted walls greeted civics teacher George Fielding as he walked the long, echoing hallway. He stopped outside Principal Holt's office when Violet emerged and handed him a string-clasped envelope. He peeked inside to find suffrage leaflets and other printed materials. Violet looked around the hallway. It arrived today from the Kansas Equal Suffrage Association, she whispered. He thanked her and continued to his classroom where several students stood laughing next to the open door. They looked away when he approached. Upon entering the classroom, some students tried to suppress their snickering. Their glances toward the blackboard revealed what amused them. George saw a caricature of himself, wearing a dress while holding a sign that said, Women Vote. He smiled and turned to the class. I see some of you are interested in women's suffrage, and I commend the artist for making me more handsome than I actually am, but that dress should persuade you not to pursue a career in fashion design. Jesse Gaines raised his hand. Mr. Fielding, does that mean we're not in trouble? Do you think you should be in trouble, Mr. Gaines? Jesse sank down in his chair and shook his head. George stepped beneath the portrait of Lincoln next to the blackboard and held up a stack of printed material. 
Mr. Gaines's artwork is timely, he said. Since the women's suffrage referendum was passed in February, it will be on the ballot in next year's election. I am authorized to invite all of you to write an essay for the county contest about why Kansans should vote for women's suffrage. The essay is voluntary, but I will offer extra credit for anyone who participates. Something that should help your grade, Mr. Gaines. Laughter. All right, everyone. Mr. Gaines isn't the only student here who can use extra credit. George held up the papers again. Come by my desk after class and take notes from this material for good information on women's suffrage. Chapter 2. May 1912. The Flint Hills West of Sycamore Falls, Kansas. Catherine steered Annabelle over the rough terrain on the grassy hillside and pulled her up to a stop when they approached the top of the hill. On this warm day in May, there was nothing like the feeling of wind through one's hair while taking in the commanding view from up here on horseback, the rooftops of Sycamore Falls and the valley, the sea of green prairie hills all around. Mary caught up to her and then urged her horse to a gallop. Catherine took the challenge dismissing that little voice in her head that said no. She didn't think anything was broken, and her impaired leg felt all right. She decided to lie still and not try to get up in a panic. Annabelle stood nearby and snorted an apology while shaking her head up and down, even though the spill wasn't the horse's fault. Mary stood over Catherine her silhouette blocking the blazing noonday sun. Catherine sat up and brushed off her riding clothes. Her hat sat in the grass a few feet away, and she put it back on after Mary fetched it. Don't move, Catherine, Mary said as she knelt next to her. Let me check you over. Catherine caught her breath. Now you can practice your nursing training. I'm not a nurse yet. Lie still and keep quiet. How do your legs feel, especially the left leg? I'm sorry, but I thought we could talk up here away from curious ears. Mary gently examined Catherine's neck, arms, legs, and pelvis, and asked if she had pain in various locations. Catherine didn't think she was really hurt, just the potential for a bruise or two. The shade under a nearby tree looked inviting. Catherine stood to take Annabelle's reins and led her to the lone tree just up the hill, the tree she should have steered Annabelle safely around before the horse banked and threw her. She wasn't an experienced rider, especially on a galloping horse over a hillside strewn with rocks. She tied the reins to a sturdy branch. Mary led her horse to the tree and secured it to the branch. A breeze flowed up there, and it was cool beneath the foliage. To the west was another grassy hill. A farmhouse with wraparound porch stood near its top. There's Ida's place, Catherine said. Mary gazed over. We should pay her a visit. It's been a while. Maybe she would consider starting up the book club again. I would like that, said Mary. I've also heard she wants to form a women's club. Catherine eyed a spot under the tree where she could sit back against the tree trunk and take in this bird's-eye view of Sycamore Falls and the scenery. Catherine, no! Just as she was about to sit, she saw it. At least it's not poisonous, said Mary. A four-foot-long black snake slithered up the trunk toward the foliage. The horses were getting restless, so Mary led them from the tree. A man on horse trotting around the base of the hill waved up to them. Oh, good, Mary said. There's Pa. Let's go down and have lunch. Can you ride? Catherine laughed. Apparently not very well. Just takes practice. Annabelle's a gentle mare, but she's quick and agile. Let's go. She helped Catherine clamber up to the saddle. Annabelle was calm now. Catherine settled onto her and they rode down to the Dodds' big house. The hilltop breeze faded as they descended. I can come over Tuesday evening, Mary said just before they reached the shaded backyard. Sounds lovely, said Catherine. 
I won't mention anything at lunch. Pa doesn't know what we're up to. He'll probably think we'll be discussing bookshop business. It's best to keep talk of the gathering to ourselves. Later that day, Catherine returned home and opened the windows to let in the breeze. The house was about ten years old, and the warmth of the day had brought out the scent of the somewhat recently applied shellac finish on the woodwork's dark stain. That evening, she puttered around the house. Her bruises were too achy to do anything but sit in the living room and read, so she lit the kerosene lamp on the little table next to her reading chair. She didn't have fancy gas or electric lights in her house yet. Perhaps in a couple of years. Lighting the rooms like this was one of the old-fashioned traditions she found acceptable. She settled into the chair and cracked open Molly Make-Believe by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott, her most recent acquisition. But it had been a tiring day, and rather than fall asleep here while reading, she went up to bed. Chapter 3 May 1912 Main Street Bookshop Catherine opened Main Street Bookshop mid-morning the next day, as she always did, balancing on her cane as she stepped over the threshold. After settling into her first task, in walked someone she hadn't seen for years. She was about Catherine's age, looking fashionable in the new decade style. You must be Catherine, she said. Catherine was setting up a new book display with Moving the Mountain by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. After she finished arranging the table, she turned to greet her visitor. I'm sorry, she said. I wanted to set this up before more customers arrive. Do you remember me? The woman asked. Of course I do. You're Anna, aren't you? Anna smiled and glanced around the shop. I was in Ida's book club with you. Do you remember we met there a while back? Yes, of course. Where have you taken yourself to? I married two years after leaving the club and we moved to Topeka. He left me for someone else and I recently decided Sycamore Falls was the best place for me now. I'm glad you're back in Sycamore Falls. Catherine hadn't liked Anna back during their book club days, but was happy she was getting on with her life. Perhaps they could reconcile their differences. Anna sighed. Me too. I missed it here. The door's little bell jingled, and Mary stepped in. We got the new books in? She said. She turned to Anna. Well, hello, I heard you were back recently. Glad to see you. Mary leaned toward her. I love the silver leaf design of your earrings. Thank you, Anna said. She stepped away toward an alcove along the wall. I'd like to browse around a little. Yes, of course, said Mary. Anna smiled, went to one of the wooden library steps in the alcove, climbed it, selected a book from a high shelf, and flipped through it. Catherine peered over at Anna for a moment. Just as the door's little bell jingled again, Anna put the book back and stepped off the small ladder. Thank you, she said to Mary and Catherine, brushing past the man who entered as she left the bookshop. The man exchanged greetings with Catherine and Mary and went to look at some of the new fiction titles. Mary took that opportunity to lean toward Catherine and whisper, Anna's coming to the meeting tonight. Ah, Catherine said. That's why she was browsing the women's subversive titles. She came by one afternoon last week when I was tending shop alone and wanted to talk about women's suffrage. Mary shrugged picked up one of the new copies of Women's Suffrage, A Short History of a Great Movement, and thumbed through it. The man left, and another man entered. Why, Mr. Fielding, Mary said. Good morning, ladies, he said. It's been a while, hasn't it? He looked at the book display. I see you've received that book. I should like to purchase one. Yes, of course, said Mary, stepping around to the back of the counter. Is this a story that will interest you? Catherine asked him. Any story with a different point of view told in an entertaining way interests me. That's commendable, Catherine said. 
Mary gave her a look indicating Catherine's manner of speech was curious. Catherine knew she embarrassed her sometimes. Mr. Fielding bought his book and left the shop. Mary followed him out, returning soon after. He's a nice man, Catherine said. He would be welcome to come to the meeting tonight. He is going to attend, said Mary. I just invited him. Mary started to set up a table in the women's section alcove while Catherine finished arranging the display of new books. It'd be nice to have meetings there, Catherine said, pointing to the alcove. But it's probably best at my home so people won't notice a gathering of women here and start asking questions. I'm fixing this alcove so customers can relax here, Mary said. The door jingled and Fred Markley, from Markley's Furniture Company a couple of doors down, entered the shop. The scent of cigar smoke embedded in his clothes came in with him. He was around fifty, with a characteristic full beard laced with gray. Hello there, he said in his gravelly voice. Mrs. Markley asked me to pick up a book for her. He reached for a copy of Women's Suffrage, a short history of a great movement. This is the one, I believe. Catherine went to the counter. Say, Mr. Markley, I notice you have a new selection of wicker furniture. We do indeed, any style you want. I'd love to come over and browse, but Mary and I are quite busy during the day. He reached into his pocket and produced a key. Then go take a look yourself when it's convenient. He handed the key to her and placed the book onto the counter with a silver dollar. I'll take this one. They settled up, and he stashed the book into his jacket and left. <laughs>